So today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue where we left off last time. So this is week two, lecture two. So it's combinational logic design. Design, actually CMOS, combinational logic design, plus uh, analog concepts, if you will. So it's all chapter three stuff. And as I returned your extra credit, if you look on the website, I have posted the solutions on the 2900 website. I didn't make a video for YouTube. So take a look at it. And pretty much uh, everybody who turned it in actually got 1% because the work was good. But look at the solution so you can see the exact solution to the problem. So that's the only announcement I had. Do you have any questions, actually, before you get started? None? So, all right. So recall where we left off was this question. So recall we wanted to implement, I think this was the function, right? x1 not or x2. Is, was this the function? Using CMOS logic, combination logic function. And we said, let's may look at a truth table to try to get an idea of what this function does. And what we determined was 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. 0, 1, 1, 1. What we determined was when x1 is 0, the output is always a 1 because it's 1 ordered with anything is 1. Okay. Now the question is, and I told you that uh, the pull-up network is CMOS. Also recall that if I have the pull-up network is PMOS, not CMOS. Here is PMOS. Here is your output Y. Here is your NMOS network, and obviously you have N inputs here, X1, X2, Xn, and then you have the same N inputs here, but basically the networks is complementary. That is, if these are in if these transistors are in series, the corresponding transistors here are in parallel and vice versa. Okay. So in other words, whenever you pull up to one or VDD, you go through the PMOS. Whenever you pull down to ground, you go through the NMOS. So how do I translate that into a design? So what would I, any ideas? And remember that the PMOS turns on when the input is what? When does the PMOS turn on? For what values of the input? Zero, right? It's complementary to the NMOS. When PMOS, is, when input is zero, PMOS turns on. When it's one, it turns off. NMOS, when the input is a one, again, I'm talking about Boolean logic, right? We'll get into analog shortly. But uh, when the input is a one, for the NMOS, it turns on. Zero, it turns off. Okay? So, so how do you, I mean, what? How do I do this? Like any ideas? None? Zero? Nothing? So here's Y. Here's ground. So I need to put a PMOS. So once you find either the PMOS or the NMOS, let's say you find the NMOS network, you can easily draw the PMOS network because it's complementary, right? So you, you have to find either this or this. So uh, what? let's do the PMOS. That's, what the, that's the hint I'll give you. The PMOS is the easiest to get. So how will I find the PMOS? I mean, just look at what we've written, right? F is 1 whenever x1 is 0. So how, I mean, F is your y, sorry. Let me call this one your y. So, OK, fine. Let's just call this F. Doesn't matter. So how do I, OK, how do I translate it into a transistor? So when x1 is 0, my F goes to a, should go to VED. So how do I put a transistor? So what do I do? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, you put a transistor like this, right? So here is one transistor. Let's call this the M1 transistor. And this is X1, okay? Notice, Something very important, and this was a solution that was suggested for those of you looking at the lecture video. With, uh, again, like I said, only my voice will be recorded because of the headset I'm using. But anyway, 
when x1 notice very important this is not complemented okay the reason is you want this transistor to turn on when x1 is zero correct so in other words complement terms in your expression if you want if you, want, you don't want to think about it like this right but the idea is complement terms can go as gate inputs to the pmos right so so whenever x1 is zero m1 turns on correct and then f goes to vdd which is exactly what you want right so i claim that you can fill in the rest of the truth table right let's fill it in but you don't need actually the truth table to figure out i claim the other transistors okay so let's just fill in the truth table let's see when x1 is 1 x1 not is 0 right again we'll do a systematic method when we talk about boolean algebra starting the end of next week and after break but i want to finish all this transistor stuff before break uh, so anyway so x1 is 1 x1 not is 0 so x1 doesn't even matter so x2 not and x3 not so to fill in the missing entries that's what you look at so when x2 is 0 x3 is 0 what is x2 not is 1 x3 not is 1 so 1 and 1 is what do you remember 1 so this becomes 1 correct so if you think about it for any other input combination the moment any one of these inputs becomes a 1 the complement of that becomes a, is a 0 right 0 and anything is 0 so rest of these or zero you see that again I'm just using the basic definition of not and or okay but this is the truth table however that you don't really need the truth table right maybe you could you you, you might say oh we use the truth table for this but not really right In the sense we said oh when x1 is a zero this output f whoops gets pulled up to vdd right that's exactly what this does right okay so based on that argument right not looking at the two table how do i i need two more transistors right one for x2 one for x3 so how do i draw them now sorry so it's okay if it's wrong just like say something like is it in parallel let's be careful so what is this saying right so it's either parallel or series right so what is this saying when is f1 and you can look at it in the truth table but when yeah when they're both zero so how do i trans yeah those two has to be in series but how do those two transistors in series how is it hooked up to the m1 transistor parallel right so the AND is series, the OR is parallel. So, and now that's the PMOS network. So let me call this, again, very careful, don't write X2 NOT here, okay? The NOT is captured by the fact that this transistor is on when X2 is zero, right? So here's M2, here is X3, here is M3. F. Okay? We're not done. That's not the complete circuit. You gotta get me the NMOS network, right? So what's the NMOS network? Yes, so X1, these two are in it's a complementary network, remember? These two are in parallel here, so they have to be in series here. Okay? And you can check this. Like, oh, does this work? Are you am I do I have a path? any shorting path from VDD to ground you want, right? And the proof for this is like very complicated. You have to take a course in and digital design of logic and it's, it's a course by itself, right? It's just, the reason why we are doing this is for to get an idea of propagation delay, which we'll do at the end of this lecture. But here it is. So this is X1 in series with the parallel combination of x2 and well, 
have a strong ground for each of them just makes it easier so ground there so ground there so here it is see and it doesn't matter if you hook this up to f and then you hook this up to ground all right it's in series of course that will affect the number of capacitors or whatever the propagation delay the way you actually lay this out on an ic but we are not concerned with all that okay we're only concerned with how you take this expression and translate it into cmos okay so any questions on this yeah no it's a good question that this circle means that this is pmos okay that's the symbol for pmos it basically tells us that the pmos is the complement of the nmos that is when x1 is zero this transistor turns on okay so in that sense you can say oh yeah zero comes into a not gate that becomes a one so if you take out this bubble that's what this is called bubble right it looks like an nmos but that's not how you want to think about it right oh that's the intention it's just the digital actually in the analog circuit world this is not the symbol for a pmos right? it's a different symbol but for us it's digital and we are interpreting this transistor circuit as a digital circuit and what we want to capture is the fact that the pmos is on whenever the input is zero okay. does that answer your question matt okay so any other you have, somebody else had a question You can. That's a very good question. So I mean, all the questions are very good, the, including Matt's question. So the question was to uh, repeat for people watching the lecture. One is why is there a bubble here, and that's just a schematic symbol. The second question is why did I do the PMOS first? The reason is it was easier for me to see that since there are these are all complemented variables, right? That means uh, whenever these when the variable itself x1 becomes zero it's getting pulled up correct right so that means pull up always implies uh pmos right let's say there are no complements then you're better off looking at the nmos network and actually that's what i was going to suggest and that's exactly my point that you want to please look at your book has solved examples okay solved examples and suggested homework problems so that will follow up the this will be a follow up to your that will be an answer to your question in the sense there are examples where he derives the nmos network first okay it do, it doesn't matter if you can see the nmos network from this go ahead right yeah question No. So the question was, it's a good question. Like the AND, the NAND or the NOR is like one kind of network. Right? It's either, I forgot, it's PMOS. I mean, I can look at it on the website, but it'll take me a long time. But that's just an example. Right? You know, there are no, I mean, the general rules for this is not part of this course. Right? You no, know, you can't. What I would suggest you do to solve these problems is you just logically think how to either do pull up or pull down, depending on if you have complemented variables or not. That's the only method for this right? and this is the most complicated problem i'll give you on an exam here here is like uh, i won't give you four inputs okay so here is like a three input logic function tell me what the cmos logic is that's all i'll give uh, so just your homework problems okay to, to that's that all right so here we are getting into this basically section 3.8 in your third edition or whatever edition you use in the syllabus the book this is called mass practical aspects okay so let's look at what we're going to do in lab tomorrow and then get into the details right so in lab tomorrow i modified it slightly in the sense we are going to use a hex inverter ic i think i mentioned this last week right the hex inverter so it's a cmos hex inverter okay, so that means The logic again. There is a power supply in this, and we'll look at it with the data sheet. How to hook up the power supply? This is what this you should know by heart. 
So let's say this is x, this is y, and okay, fine, I'll put VDD in ground. What is the transistor configuration of this? How many P mass, how many N mass do I have? So for one inverter, how many P mass, how many N mass? One P mass and one N mass, right? This is what it looks like, okay? So here is X, here is Y, here is VDD, okay? And that's ground, all right? So we're going to primarily do two things in this lab. Number one, we're going to look at what is called prop. So let me address the first one first. Number one, we're going to look at what is called as the propagation delay. And we'll cover this in more detail this week and next week. But the lab is just to give you an idea of this. And let's talk about the idea that is where it comes from. It's denoted by tau p. Okay, that's the symbol. Propagation delay. And there, tau p is actually defined as tau low to high plus tau high to low. Right. So this is what is called as the low. And we'll talk about where this comes from. Low to high propagation delay. Okay. And this is the high to low propagation delay, okay? So what does all this mean? So what does this mean? So let me look at my notes here because I got to get this. Okay, so it's not in my all right, so let's look at it this way. Let's say you have the simple circuit. This is what you're gonna do in lab tomorrow. VD. This is inside the chip. Okay, you don't really see this. But you're gonna see its effects. The sense, okay. So let's say I make my x was initially 0, okay? So function of time, logic 0. And then I make it go to logic 1, all right? So initially this was 0, and then I make it go to 1. So ideally, what is, oh God, don't tell me it crashed. So ideally, what is the output going to look like? Yep, it crashed. Let me get back onto this. So what's the output going to look like? What's Y going to look like? Yeah, I, that's it, right? Ideally, is what it's going to do. From 1 down to 0. Okay? Right? No order. But practically, what's going to happen is as I change the input from 0 to 1, remember I told you that these are capacitors, correct? So they are going to take time to charge up, okay? Specifically, okay, so practically, this is what's going to happen. Okay. Practically, when the input, when x equals 0, Which transistor is on and which transistor is off? What's the state of the P MOS and what's the state of the N MOS? P MOS is on, N MOS is off, and that makes sense, right? That's the way Y gets pulled up. Yes, this is the pull-up network, right? So when X goes to a one, right, P MOS turns off after a delay. Right? And the N MOS turns on after a delay. Correct? 
So practically what you're going to see, so how's this? So what, let me use a different color. I don't want to use all red, but so how do you capture this? So here's the practical plot. How would you capture this as an engineer? What would you do? No, we are not looking at the analog waveforms. This is the digital waveforms. No, just tell me how in this, what would you do? You want to capture this delay onto this plot. No, we're not looking at analog. Like, we're just looking at digital. Right? There's no, like, because this is not really a linear capacitor. It's it's much more complicated than that. So, it looks like a ramp, actually, but it's, I don't, I don't want to talk about the, I don't want to think about it like a ramp. Like, how would I simply incorporate this information? Is your answers are all correct, right? Like, in terms of analog. Right? No, not curved edge. Like, so yeah, it's a delay on the x-axis, right? So what I would do is, instead of making this go at zero, I would make it go, I would do this, right? Digitally. I would say, oh, wait for some time, and then go down like that. Yes? So this is your, and you'll notice this. This is the first thing you'll notice in lab tomorrow, right? Actually, you, so this is called the propagation delay, high to low, right? Now, be very careful. This high to low, low to high depends on what signal you're looking at, okay? In this case, I'm looking at, you could say this is the output high to low propagation delay, right? The reason why I mentioned that is this inverter could be connected to another inverter, right? So when this line changes, that could mean this is the input to a follow-up inverter, right? In this case, we just have a single inverter. But anyway, this is the high to low for the output. Make sense? And uh, this is the first thing you're going to do in lab. You're going to look at the propagation delay. And correspondingly, let me go back. Let's say, okay, let me use a different color. I'm not going to draw this inverter anymore because, it, I mean, in terms of CMOS, it takes too long. So let's say the input goes from 1 to a 0, right? Y. So what is the output Y going to look like? Practically speaking, right? Again, so initially it was a zero, correct? The N mass was on, right? When the input goes to a zero, the P mass turns on, right? So it's going to get pulled up, correct? Okay. Do you think, so this is tau P low to high, right? So do you think high to low is equal to low to high? No, not necessarily, right? It's because the P mass and the N mass, they remember they're whole electron, right? But the transistors are built, usually the mobility of holes. Okay, for, for a very simplistic standpoint, you could say the mobility of holes is half the mobility of an electron, okay, of electrons. So what engineers do is they size the P mass transistor twice as wide. So it compensates for it. Practical uh, ICs are designed so the high to low is the same as low to high under normal operating conditions. Okay, but you will see this delay, and I don't remember what the C. You can actually look at the data sheet; it'll probably tell you what the low to high, high to low delay is, assuming you re reproduce the test conditions. Okay? But I think it's on the order of like a few nanoseconds. It's very small, okay? but for this part of the lab, what you have to do is we have to, and this is why all of you, when you said analog waveforms, you're correct, but we're going to use basically the logic analyzer. We are not going to use the scope, okay? although the logic analyzer is part of the scope setup. So we'll switch it uh, to CMOS mode and then measure the delays. Right? I don't remember if the low to high and high to low are the same. Just measure it and figure it out. And it's also affected by, let's say, this node is floating, right? If there is a capacitance on your breadboard, it'll affect it, definitely, right? Like if there's a large capacitance. 
So the mere numbers you are going to get tomorrow in lab across. Uh, I ask you, we'll talk about this in lab tomorrow. I ask you to do labs individually because these labs are very fundamental. But I don't know if we have enough stations. What room are we in? Okay, so look it up. So uh, well, I have it on my phone. Yep, we're in 312. I don't remember if S312, the iron stations. We'll see, right? The new lab, right? Is it the new one? I don't think we have enough stations, but we'll see tomorrow in lab. However, for the first part, use the logic analyzer, okay? Okay, for the second part, let's discuss that and let's get into analog models. What we're going to do is we're going to look at, so this is the second, so first part is propagation delay, okay? Second part is what is called as the voltage transfer characteristic or VTC. That's what it's abbreviated as. Okay. This is basically the analog version of what we just did. However, something very important, instead of plotting, so I'm going to call this V in, I'm going to call this V out now because it's analog. Instead of plotting V in as a function of time and V out as a function of time, we are going to plot V out versus V in. Okay? That's what it's called as a transfer characteristic. It's not a function. It's not a transfer function. It's not linear. Right? So what do you think V out versus V in looks like? That is when V in is very low. Okay? Again, now we're talking analog. I'm not saying Vn is equal to zero. Well, we can start at zero, but then when Vn is very low, it's analog values. What do you what do you think V out is? When Vn is very low, what's V out? High. How high? One or VDD, correct? So it's gonna start at VDD. Then what's gonna so let's go to the other extreme. When Vn is very high, that is equal to VDD and less, what is V out? So when V in is zero, for example, the output is exactly VDD. That's V in equals zero, V out equals one, right? So by the same token, when V in, the maximum you can go is the supply voltage and some small, some little less than the supply voltage, what's the output? What's the output? Low, exactly what is so when Vn is equal to VDD or 1, what is V out? Zero. So it's really low voltage. And what do you think happens in the middle? It does this, right? So the, it goes like that. So this is what the transfer characteristic is going to look like, right? And this is important because you can say, remember we said, okay, when Vn is very close to zero, when Vn is very close to VDD, right? So how close is close? That is, how for what range of input voltages can you still consider the output when the input voltage is very low, the output to be equal to one, right? How do you define that? And the definition is basically this point, this is called V in low threshold. And we'll talk about this. Okay, let me draw this. Let me erase this, leave this on here. Let's draw a bigger picture. Okay. So first of all, is everybody clear that this is what V out versus V in looks like? It's called the voltage transfer characteristic. And in lab, I'll tell you the function generator settings which tell you, which let you get this. You just have to get the VTC. The measurements, we don't, we're not gonna do, right? But this is where we're eventually heading towards. That is VDD, looks something like this. It's a smooth curve. to VDD. Right? This is zero. Okay? And this is volts. And this is volts. So obviously, the, for this range, you're not at either logic one or zero. Okay? This is the undefined region. For digital, we don't care about this. Right? What we would like to know is for what range of input voltage can you actually consider the output to be logic high, all right? And the definition which engineers use 
is when this slope here, this delta equals negative 1, right? That corresponding input is called the input load threshold, right? And I'll define this uh, shortly. These are so basically, and there's a corresponding definition for the high range, okay? So from the reason why this plot is important is VTC will define what is called as noise margins. That is, what range of input voltage can your trans can your CMOS gate tolerate to be defined as low and defined as high? Make sense? And I'll tell you the we'll get into the exact definitions of noise margins next week, but this is just to show you why you're doing this in lab tomorrow, okay? Okay? Any questions about lab tomorrow? You're gonna to do two things. The propagation delay, low to high, high to low, little one A, one B. Second thing is plot the VTC, okay? It'll help you understand how to use the logic analyzer on the scope, along with the functionality. Uh, no, the handout looks like, it's kind of the handout is very lame, right? If you will, I'll show you the handout. It's just like do these four things. So in lab tomorrow, I'll discuss uh, what the exact thing to do is. Okay, yeah, because this lab is actually. All right, let's take a look. So I'm not gonna. Okay. So the next part, the actual analog aspects of the mass transistor are important conceptually because you need to learn where all these delays and all come from. Or for that, you need the analog model. So let's start it today. We'll continue it next lecture. And we're really getting into the most difficult one-eighth part of the course. One-eighth part of the course. So the goal of doing all this is to understand origins of propagation delay. It's very simple. That is... You could summarize it in one sentence. So the first step is you need to understand the NMOS analog model. Okay. Unfortunately, I'll just give you the model. Right? However, it is not difficult to appreciate this model. So let's look at the recall the NMOS transistor. So what is this terminal called? What is it called? Oh, I forgot already. What's this called? The gate, right? So abbreviated G. Okay. Assuming this should be the symbol for NMOS, okay? But, okay, let me do this. I won't confuse you with that symbol. So let's just, I remember I told you that the source terminal is straight to the bulk, correct? You really don't have, you, technically a transistor has four terminals. You always have three. So, um, so this is the source. That's the drain. So which direction should current flow? In this N mass. Drain to source, right? This, is, this has to be it. Okay. So basically now we have to define two primary voltages, VGS. So let me put this as ID so because it can get confusing. And VDS. Okay, again, the reason why I like this part is it helps you, it reinforces circuit analysis concepts. So concept number one, is there any other voltage I can define? Yes or no? Yes, which one? VGD, right? But the good news is we don't care about it, right? Because it doesn't play a role in the model, that's why. So, unlike your resistor, like we discussed, your, so let me just plot this. To actually quantify this transistor, that is the transistor current, drain current, right? Again, why don't we care about the gate current in steady state? Why don't we care about it? Yeah, at steady state, there's no current. The capacitor is charged, so it's very small. And the reason I say it's steady state is going back here, we do this on off business, okay? You have to, there is current flowing in here, okay? You have to charge and discharge capacitors. So the dynamic 
power dissipation of your FET circuits is not zero. Static is almost zero. And yeah, this is very, it's a pretty, uh, excuse me, complicated model, the transistor model, but it's amazing that people know so much about it. That is, the semiconductor physics is so well studied. But anyway, so what we need to quantify the transistor is you need a three-dimensional plot. We did this last time, so, because you have VDS and VGS, okay? However, that's not how people plot this. You can plot it, right, in MATLAB. It kind of looks cool, right? But, so basically, for uh, the transistor ID versus VDS characteristic is what people use most of the time. That's what we will look at in the sense what people do is they look at a particular VGS, okay? So they they stick a voltage in here and then they sweep, for example, this drain to source voltage, measure the current. It's called as a parametric plot, right? So simplest case, when VGS equals zero volts, what's ID? When this voltage is zero, what's ID? It's an N mass. Zero. Looks like this. Okay? When VGS go, goes above the threshold voltage, the curve approximately looks like this, right? So let me so actually draw this in and I'm not and we're gonna let's stop like running out of time. So I don't wanna start this now. I'll start this the equations and stuff on uh, whenever we have Friday, the last lecture, okay? But before that, you heard transistors can be used as amplifiers, right? Why? Does anyone know why? Why they work as amplifiers? Yeah. That's right. So if you have a small uh, input voltage, that's what an amplifier does. Your drain to source voltage can be large. But why? For intuitively, why does it work? In other words, let me so give you a practical. So this line is actually not flat, right? This line is, it's got a little slope to it. This is what it looks like. Okay? Basically, a transistor has three regions of operation, right? This is called cutoff when VGS is less than V threshold, okay? So, and V threshold is positive. VGS less than V threshold, transistor is off. Again, I'm only talking about NMOS, enhancement mode uh, NMOS transistor. We're not talking about PMOS, we're not talking about depletion mode. Transistor is off. The, pro the point of me telling you that is the complexity underlying this is pretty enormous, but people have a good hang of it. But when VGS is greater than V threshold, you have two regions of operation, right? One is called the triode region, and the other, oops, it's writing on this tablet is hard. Okay. This is called the triode region, and you have what is called as the saturation region. But in reality, the saturation region has a small slope. So let's see if you really, this is very hard, okay? It took me like five years to understand this. Like, I mean, nobody ever explained it to me and whatever, right? I, then I found out it's in a lot of books, but anyway, let's think. So why does the transistor work as an amplifier? So looking at this plot. So can you tell me in which region the transistor has to work? It basically has three regions, right? Cutoff, triode, and saturation. Which region you think it has to work in, or it has to be biased in, for it to function as an amplifier? Cutoff? No, cutoff transistors off. Doesn't do anything, right? Cutoff is gone. Is it triode or is it saturation and why? This is like very hard to figure out. So I think we have like three more minutes. So it's <laughs> well, let's say the triode or saturation. So I'll tell you, no, it's not triode. You can bias it in the triode region, but it's not the triode region. Why? So how does a little slope help? But how? I know it amplifies, but how? 
So think about it this way, right? In the tri, try to think about it this way. If I think about it in the triode region, I have an IV curve, right? So magically, I make the transistor work here. So how do I model physically? Just think about the triode region only. What does this remind you of? The IV, straight line, going through the origin. Okay, just hide this. Okay, just don't even, just think that this line keeps going up. Constant slope. What kind of a device? Resistor, correct? So, but where is this resistor? Right here, between the drain and the source, right? Because it's ID versus VDS. Yes, just look at this plot, right? Okay, so you have a resistor here. Now, is this resistance high or low? No, it's not relative. How do you get a resistance from the IV graph? This uh, is the resistance a slope? Yeah, it's V with respect to I. It's one over the slope, correct? So now, compared to the triode region and the saturation region between these, okay. So don't look at this. Here the slope is zero, right? This won't make sense if you're thinking about resistance. That's why I put a little slope here, right? So between, now be very careful, right? Between the saturation region and the triode region, which has larger resistance, Saturation, correct? Because it's got smaller slope. One over the smaller slope is larger resistance. If I pass a small current through a resistance and I want a large voltage, should my resistance be small or large? Large. That's it. The fact that this transistor has a small slope in the saturation region implies amplification when you bias this transistor in the saturation region. Makes sense? That's how it works. Right? That's, am amplifi that's amplifier action. Now, this is only valid <laughs> for FET. Okay, For BJT, this doesn't work. Throw it out. Right? BJT is completely different. Actually, the BJT saturation is the triode. The BJT triode is the satur saturation, whatever. It's like flipped around. Right? It's because of the physics. That's where all this term comes from. But basically, the reason why transistors... FET transistors, field effect transistors used as amplifiers, is because in the saturation region, when you bias a transistor, the slope is really small, the resistance is large, and it it works well in the sense here is an amplifier, right? For example, it's called as a common source amplifier. Remember our friend VDD. Remember the RTL guy, right? If you don't think about this as digital, if you think about it as analog, this is what is called as a common source amplifier. It's called as common source because your source is grounded. Okay? But the problem is this amplifier has crappy frequency response. Right? So that's, and it's not very stable. Okay? That's why you have the op amp circuit where you have a input stage, gain stage, and output stage. Right? That's why you have op amps. Because your op amp has a very nice bandwidth where the gain is constant. This one doesn't have that. But it's all, so <laughs> if one of the transistors in your, inside your op amp goes out of saturation, right, especially your gain stage, your screw, okay, you lose amplification. Makes sense? But well, that's it. It's very, very simple. It's this little slope, converted resistance means large. You pass a small current, boom, you get amplification. Right? So, yeah, it's it's took me a long time to understand that, but there it is. Right? In like, whatever, five minutes. All right, we're done.